few years ago, I sat in on an RCIA class. I wasn't part of the team or the parish. I just happened to be visiting and thought it'd be great to meet the catechumens, see how the class was taught a little differently, try to learn something myself. It turned out to be a bit of an awkward situation for me. The topic of the night was sin, and so as an introduction, the catechist did this exercise where he called out different actions and asked the catechumens to say whether or not they thought it was a sin. I wasn't particularly enthused by the idea, but my initial reaction was ambivalent. Meh, probably not the best exercise, but maybe he'll use it to spark some debate, we'll get them thinking, offering him an opportunity to teach, so whatever. That feeling of ambivalence faded almost immediately. There was no debate. There really wasn't even much explanation or discussion. For about five minutes, he listed off actions and then just emphatically told them whether or not it was a sin. Occasionally, someone would protest and try to give some reasoning against what the catechist said, but he just shut it down. The issue was black and white. Either it is or it isn't a sin, and there is no in-between or debate. For things like murder or theft, this might not seem like such a problem. No one's really gonna argue that these things are good. But what about speeding in the car, swearing or drinking alcohol? These things are not as clear cut, and yet he had an emphatic answer for each one. At one point, he asked the class what they thought about eating greasy fast food or junk food. Probably not something you'd expect to be considered a sin, and so the whole class said it was fine. Wrong, these things are not good for your body, and so show you don't love the gift that God has given you. Sin. In that moment, I think my brain just melted. It was like a calculator saying, does not compute. I was so confused and angry at what I was hearing that I was just speechless, which was probably a good thing as I was a visitor in this class and probably shouldn't come in and tell the teacher he has no idea what he's talking about. But come on, this is not the way that our moral theology works. When we as Catholics try to evaluate actions through a moral lens, there isn't just a definitive list to consult that is universally true in every case. There is the act itself, yes, and there may be some intrinsic value to that action, but there are other factors that must be considered as well. One's intention is critically important to evaluating morality of an action. What was the primary ends that the person was trying to achieve through this act? Was it clearly thought out and intentional, or was it an accident? Was it meant to bring good or to bring harm? Two people can perform the exact same act, but because they have different intentions, the moral weight is different. Take, for instance, killing someone by running them over with a car. Is it a sin? Well, it depends. While never a moral good to take another's life, there's a huge difference between premeditated murder, going out of your way to hit them, accidental manslaughter due to negligence, you ran a stoplight and didn't see them, and a complete accident, they didn't look and walked right in front of your car. Despite being the exact same action, the morality of the three are radically different because the intention is different. One sought to do evil in itself, murder. One sought to do a lesser evil, running a stoplight, and one intended no evil at all. They were just driving. What's important about intention and why this catechist exercise was ridiculous is that even good acts with the wrong intentions can be morally corrupt. Take, for example, giving alms to the poor through a donation to the church. Obviously a good act in itself, right? And yet there are many reasons that one might do this. For the well-being of the poor, for the acclaim of society, to launder dirty money as a tax write-off. The same act, very different morality. For this reason, the church teaches that even good things can be sins if they're done for evil reasons. When we evaluate morality, one's intention is critically important. Another factor that must be considered is the circumstance in which the action was committed. Were there mitigating factors that influenced the action or impeded one's freedom? How thoroughly was the action carried out? Social pressures, environmental factors, and personal constraints can all have an effect on a situation. Unlike intention, they can't change the morality of an act from good to bad or bad to good, but they can certainly affect a person's responsibility as it relates to the act. Take our running someone over with a car situation again. Let's say that it's intentionally done, but it was done because a passenger in the car was holding a gun to the driver's head, in effect forcing them to do it. This presents a very different situation than the driver acting on their own volition. Because it's an evil act done intentionally for an evil end, it is definitely a sin either way, but being under duress and fearing one's death greatly diminishes one's culpability in the matter. An often overlooked factor in this regard is culture. While the objective value of an act might be the same, theft is always bad, if certain actions are more prevalent, more accessible, or even more ingrained in the culture milieu, this may affect one's culpability as well. Take an extreme example. 
you live in the United States in 1860, and so you own slaves. Not great. Slavery, bad thing. Unfortunately, it's legal, and everyone else you know owns them, and so there's no way that you could compete in business unless you have slaves yourself. So you keep them. While the act of owning slaves is always wrong no matter the situation, owning slaves today, when the United States recognizes how horrible it is and no one openly owns slaves anymore, would greatly increase the culpability of the act. Despite being the very same act with the very same intention, the situation increases the severity. When we evaluate the morality of human life, it is not enough to look only at the action in a vacuum. Intention and circumstance play a huge role. Simply asking whether or not something is a sin, as this catechist did, shortchanges what we believe about moral theology. Of course, I know what some of you are thinking. Does this mean that all morality is relative? That there's no objective moral code that we must follow? Surely, there must be things that are sins no matter the intention or circumstance. According to the church, there are what are called intrinsic evils, actions that, no matter the intention or circumstance, are always flawed and can never be done. While no comprehensive list has ever been put forth, the Second Vatican Council offered a number of examples. Whatever is hostile to life itself, such as any kind of homicide, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, and voluntary suicide. Whatever violates the integrity of the human person, such as mutilation, physical and mental torture, and attempts to coerce the spirit. Whatever is offensive to human dignity, such as subhuman living conditions, arbitrary imprisonment, deportation, slavery, prostitution, and trafficking in women and children. Degrading conditions of work, which treat laborers as mere instruments of profit and not as free responsible persons. All these and the like are a disgrace, and so long as they infect human civilization, they contaminate those who inflict them more than those who suffer injustice, and they are a negation of the honor due to the Creator. There are definitely things that are morally evil no matter the intention or circumstance. The Church clearly says so here and in the Catechism, and had the Catechist chosen from this list exclusively, I probably wouldn't have had as big of a problem with his black and white mentality. Then again, I still think I would have had a bit of a problem with it. You see, even when dealing with actions like these, even when it is evil no matter what, intention and circumstance still matter. Just because something is always sinful doesn't mean that it's actually worse than other things or that one's culpability is necessarily high. Abortion is a horrible act. Even when the life of the mother is at risk, nothing can ever justify the murder of an innocent person, and so it's always a sin. Not going to Mass, on the other hand, is not necessarily a sin. In the case of illness, burdensome travel, or lack of availability, one is free from that obligation. But if the reason that someone doesn't go to Mass is because they're making a defiant act against God, showing God that they hate Him and reject His love, the act of skipping Mass becomes worse, given the intention and circumstance, than the faithful woman, torn inside with the moral dilemma, choosing to have an abortion to save her own life. Just because it is always sinful doesn't mean that it's the most sinful. Intention and situation matter. And I think we do our moral theology injustice when we think too simplistically. Sure, it's easy to have narrow categories and to put things in boxes. Sure, it makes us feel like we're in control and we like that. But the fact of the matter is that human morality is messy. The same actions can be done for different reasons and have completely different results. Morality is not a one-size-fits-all sort of study. It requires patience and careful discernment. My hope in sharing this today is not to relativize sin or to encourage people to find loopholes. I'm not trying to justify anything or say that sin doesn't matter. Clearly, it does. But like a doctor diagnosing a cancer patient, it is not enough to ask broad questions and then administer radiation all over the body. If our goal is to turn away from sin, to remove evil from our world, it's important that we know where the problem truly lies. Sometimes it's in the act itself, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes there are more things to consider. 